My full name is Harry M. Young, Jr. And I was born here in Christian County, in the Herndon community, on the seventh day of January, 1919. When my dad first got the idea of no tillage, and as I said, that was in Southern Illinois, George McKibben had, uh, had the test plot that he saw. He came home and said, I think I can do that. So he found an old two-row mule-drawn planter that was sitting in the fence row, rusting. He got the idea of how he could adapt that for no tillage. He took it to a local shop because my grandfather, my uncle, my dad at that time didn't even have a welder on the farm. So he took it down to the place where everybody went to get their welding done, Rob's shop, run by Rob Thomas. And he explained to him what he wanted to have done. Uh, he made it adapted to go underneath a 140 Farmall tractor. Uh, and Rob Thomas did the welding, put it together. We mounted it, I say we, <laughs> my dad mounted it on the 140 and took uh, the chance of his life uh, to go out and actually plant a crop that had not been tilled in any way previous to that planting. And that was the way it began. And what does Catherine think of no tillage on the farm? Do you have an opinion on no tillage what, on the farm? What's no tillage? <laughs> yeah, no tillage is the way we plant crops. With the planter, instead of plowing up the ground, we burn it back with chemical, and then we put the seed right in the ground without doing anything. So it's, there is no tillage involved. That's why it's called no tillage. It is an honor to be part of the lineage, just the, the, the heritage, I guess. That's an overused word, I think, when you talk about generational farms. But it really is a family tradition, one of experimentation and innovation. Uh, in 1962, their total corn crop was 92 acres. He and my uncle uh, and my grandfather at that time farmed together. Right now, my son Alexander and I and the other family members and landowners uh, plant about 2,300 acres of corn, 2,300 acres of wheat, and 2,300 acres of soybeans. So we have in the neighborhood of 4,600 acres of land from which we get those double cropped soybeans planted behind wheat. So I guess that would be around 6,900 acres. So that's quite a change, quite a, quite a uh, enlargement. But you know, that's kind of the way things are. The farmers have to get bigger in order to support their families. It's a very tight economic situation, has been up and down for years, and that's some of the reason why we've had expansion. Our spray program has changed quite a bit over time. Believe it or not, though, one of the standard chemicals that my dad used in 1962, atrazine, is still with us. And it has still been a remarkably good product and very little uh, resistance, or at least effective resistance, has developed. Other things have come along that attack different modes of action. And I must say that the, the chemical companies have done more to advance no tillage and therefore the saving of, of topsoil than just about any other part of the agribusiness community. Without herbicides, without those chemicals, no tillage would not work. And if no tillage doesn't work, then you have the topsoil, which is gonna end up in Kentucky, going all the way to New Orleans and forming sediment that increases the delta. There's always a trade-off in anything that we do. You can only be one place at a time. You can only go to one church at a time. You can only be a member of one family at a time. And as far as agriculture goes, you can only do one method at a time on any given location, whether it's an acre or a field. And that's why I say that it's very important that we understand that if we go back to the time when we till the soil, whether you want to do it from organic production or any other method, if you're going to till the soil, you're going to lose the soil. It was proven to be the case before there was no tillage, and I think it's still the case. You cannot till the soil without losing the soil. No tillage is the best thing I know of at the moment. It may not be perfect, but it's the best thing I know of at the moment to keep the soil where it belongs, and that's right here on the family farm. 
Well, it's a great act of conservation, the conservation of the soil, the preservation of our ecosystem, you know, the, the breeding of wildlife that comes from no-till farming. It's really neat to be part of that tradition. No tillage was started as a way to preserve the soil and to conserve the soil, to keep it where it, where it, where it needs to be, which is on the home farm. We've seen a lot of improvements in that. The sheet erosion is pretty much controlled now, even though there is some problem with gully erosion, no matter, no matter what kind of uh, practices you use. You can have a permanent pasture and you still have some gully erosion. But the land itself is improved as the soil organic matter is improved. Uh, some people nowadays call it carbon sequestration. I call it soil organic matter because that's what really allows us to maintain fertility and tilth and productivity in a soil. When I was a child and my dad was first starting this back in the early 1960s, an average soil test would be about one and a half percent organic matter. We consistently have 3% or 3.5% organic matter now in our soil tests simply because the land has been allowed to accumulate the carbon, which is in effect um, organic matter. And that in turn keeps it from washing away as easily. It makes it more productive. It keeps the nutrients where they belong. And it doesn't allow things to wash down the river and, and cause trouble and pollution. The old saying used to be, no till, no crop. <laughs> and that was uh, people who cast aspersions at it to, to say, well, if you want to try that, you can, but you're not going to get anything out of it. Well, he knew it would work because he had tried it. In fact, when Dr. Shirley Phillips came down for the very first time to talk to my dad, uh, by his own statement, uh, Dr. Phillips said he came down to prove that it wouldn't work. <laughs> and he got down here and he checked and he found out that it did work, and my goodness, we better get on board with that. You know, I'd like to sit here and tell you that I could see all this uh, opportunity developing and so forth, but uh, I was about as reluctant and about it, no tillage about as much as uh, anyone at the point in time. In fact, I guess I really started out to prove that it uh, wouldn't work, and much to my surprise, it did. So he and my dad became fast friends. There was still a lot of uh, skepticism, and there still is. There are still farmers who don't plant their crops, no tillage. I can't explain why, you'd have to ask them. But for us, it's been good. It has proven itself to be a highly productive, highly efficient way of farming. And I'm thankful that he did what he did. Now Shirley and I, early on, we had worked very closely together in developing no tillage techniques. And one day uh, he was coming down and I met him uh, at a country store to get a sandwich and we got to talking and at that time we thought we had amassed enough information that we could write a book and so we sort of dared each other why don't we why don't we put what we know and what we have been able to learn from other research people in other states together and write a book on no-tillage farming we decided to do it i spoke to a group a few years ago the local daughters of the american revolution about no-till farming. And one of the articles I referenced was a conservation study, wildlife numbers and things that you wouldn't associate with row crop farming. They found that the numbers of, uh, not endangered species, but species of animals that were thinning were bolstered in a no-till system. You have greater, um, greater life in the soil, which attracts birds and things that would be attracted to the worms and the bugs that come into a no-till system. And then you have predators that prey on the birds and you just have a, a, an increase in that ecosystem. And it is really amazing how such a small thing as not working your soil and letting it wash away impacts the whole environment. And so to be part of that, not just to have a grandfather that helped pioneer it, but to take part in it, to use it on the farm, is really an awesome opportunity. You know, we've been doing cover crops for 50 years. Our cover crop is called wheat. <laughs> we plant wheat immediately following corn, and then we plant beans immediately following the wheat. So the only time that our ground is not covered specifically with a cover crop might be 
in between the November harvest of the double crop soybeans and the April planting of the next year's corn crop. So we've done cover crops in Western Kentucky, wow, for decades. I would love to be able to plant cover crops after the soybeans and have something that I can actually harvest and sell before I plant corn the following spring. I have yet to find that. And I have asked a lot of people uh, about what I, can, what I can find to sell. They say, well, you're, you're missing the point, John. You need to just plant it for the benefit of the cover crop itself. And to some extent, that's true. The land is always better when it has something green that's growing on it. It's just like every bit of agriculture. There's always more to know. We don't know a lot. In fact, I'll reference one of my favorite quotations from one of my favorite inventors, Thomas Edison. He said, and I think it's still true, we don't know one millionth of 1% 1 of anything. There's so much yet to discover and so much yet to develop. We just think we know it all, but we really don't. God knows it all and we don't know one millionth of 1% 1 of anything. Unfortunately, we've had a rainy weekend. We cannot plant corn. We would love to be in the cornfields here, but instead we're hauling last season's corn. We've got our grain system here. We're loading out a truck. It's gonna to go to our local farmer-owned cooperative and they'll sell it for ethanol, for carbon dioxide, and for animal feed. And there are other sub-markets. Some of it goes to distilleries. Some of it goes to hog houses, chicken houses, dog food but they do an excellent job of marketing the owners, the farmers, commodities that we deliver. You know, my, my dad graduated from the University of Kentucky with a master's degree, and I did my undergraduate work at the University of Kentucky, and we've had a lot of communication through the years with the, the staff at the Princeton Experiment Station. Uh, Dr. Lloyd Murdoch is a good example. Uh, Lloyd Murdoch is a man who I would say, if he says something, you can take it to the bank and he has specifically done work with cover crops and I think most recently on ryegrass on a corn soybean rotation and how it has helped alleviate the pan, the natural occurring pan in some of our Western Kentucky poorly drained soils. I would, I would go to them uh, in a heartbeat if I have a, a problem either with an unknown disease or a, a soil uh, fertility question and I'm looking forward to the expanded experiment station at, at Princeton, and I hope they'll prove to be just as efficient and professional as the ones that I've known in the past. <laughs>